the great crisis. Maranatha, page 131, the second paragraph says, A great crisis awaits the who? People the people of God. God. But this crisis extends beyond the people of God. It goes on to say what? A crisis awaits the what? The world. So yes, there's a crisis, a great crisis awaits the people of God, but the crisis also extends to what? The world. The, world. the most momentous struggle of all ages is just before us. Friends, you heard that? Yes. The most momentous struggle in all ages is just before us. That's what this discussion is about this morning. And this evening is all going to prepare for that momentous struggle. But are we ready for the issue? I, I feel sometimes like Jeremiah. I have a lamentation. And my poor sister will drive me sometimes. Come here. She hears my lamentation all the time. I have a lamentation for this Adventist church. Woeful lamentation. We're sleeping. But are we ready for the issue? As Adventists, I don't think we're ready for the issue. Have we faithfully discharged the duty which God has committed to us of giving the people a warning of the danger before them? No. I mean, it's just, it's just, it's just, it's just it's a reasonable question. Yeah. If you are placed as a watchman, the watchman is sleeping. Mm -hmm. And the city demise, whose fault it is? The watchman. watchman, the blood is on his shoulder. Yes. And we as Adventists have been placed as watchmen mm -hmm. for a struggle that is to come and is with us. And we're not giving a warning. Mm -hmm. Our discussion is going to re revolve around this great crisis. Our discussion is going to revolve around Revelation 13, 1 to 18. We're going to spend much of our time in Revelation 13, 1 to 10. And then we're going to transition to Revelation 13, 11 to 18. So let's get right into it because we have a lot to talk about and I want to be efficient. Revelation 13, verse 1 says, And I stood upon the sand of the sea and I saw a beast. Rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. So a beast was seen having seven heads. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven heads, and ten horns. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Rose out of the sea. A beast. Well, what's a beast in Bible prophecy? Let's not guess. Let's let the Bible interpret itself. Daniel 7.23 says, Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth one. Kingdom. kingdom. So a beast is, it represents a what? A kingdom. a kingdom. So a beast represents a kingdom or a civil power or the state or the government or a political system. Is that all consistent? Yes. Yes. So we see here a civil power, a nation rising out of the sea. And then Revelation 13 verse 2 gives more details. It says, and the beast which I saw was like unto what? Leopard, and his feet was as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Well, we have recognized this composite beast. Leopard, bear, lion, and dragon as seen in Daniel chapter 7. Where Daniel chapter 7 speaks about four beasts rising, yes? yes. First one we call is what? Babylon, then what? Medo Persia, then what? Greece, then Pig and Rome. So we see in Revelation 13, verse 1 and 2, that a beast that rises a composite of these previous beasts or previous kingdoms. Are you following so far? Yes. No? We have studied before Daniel chapter 7, and we have identified the similarities and the parallel between Daniel 7, Revelation chapter 13, so we can understand which beast is this. Rising out of the sea in Revelation chapter 13, verse 1 and 2. Are you with me still? Yes. Well, Daniel says, The little horn that rose up from the fort speaks pompous words. Mm -hmm. And we see Revelation 13 speaking pompous, speaking great things again in verse 5, Revelation 13. Blaspheme against God, Daniel 7. Blaspheme against God, Revelation 13, verse 5 and 6. Reigns for the same time period. 1,260 years, similarly, the beast in Revelation 13. Makes war against the saints, makes war against the saints. Overcome the saints, overcome the saints. So is it too much of a stretch to believe that the beast in Daniel 7 is the same as the beast in Revelation chapter 13? Yes. Not a stretch, is it a stretch? No. no. So we have learned before that the first beast rising out of the sea here is a Roman Catholic church state system from our previous study in Daniel chapter 7. 
Are we good so far? Lit horn. Yes. So we're not going to spend much time deliberating that point. That's pretty clearly understood amongst us. Amen? Amen. Yeah. All right. So we said Roman Catholic church state system. Why do I use the word church state? Well, that's exactly what it is. A church and a what? A state. How so? The Roman Catholic church state system. The Holy See is what is described as church jurisdiction. So wherever the Catholic church is over the entire world, it's a part of the Holy See. Are you following me? Yes. It's the church's jurisdiction. But the Catholic church system, state church system, also has its own state called the Vatican City State, mm -hmm. where the Pope is the head of that city state. Mm -hmm. An independent state within Rome itself, yeah. within Italy itself. Are you following me, friends? Yes. And here we see the ambassador of Paraguay presenting his papers to the Pope. So a church and a state. So the first beast that arises in Revelation 13, verse 1 and 2 is a church and a state. All right, very good. We've got that established. Now, Revelation 13, verse 5 gives us some time prophecy here. It says, And there was given unto him that first beast, a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given him to continue for how long? Forty and two months. That's forty-two months. No. In Bible interpretation, in prophetic interpretation, one prophet a day equal to one yeah. literal year. Is that something made up or is there no. biblical structure support to that? Yes. Biblical. Numbers 14, verse 34, and Ezekiel 4, verse 5 and 6 tells us that what? One prophetic day equal one yeah. literal year. So, one prophetic month is 30 days. Therefore, 42 months is 42 by 30, 1 to the 260 yes. years. So Revelation 13 verse 5 saying, This power rising out of the sea, which we identify to be the Roman Catholic Church state system, will have 1 to the 260 years of supremacy. Are we good so far? Yes. Alright, so what, what's the starting point? Well, we know from historical accounts, that in 530 AD, the Justinian decree was a in the Justinian decree, the Justinian then the emperor appointed the bishop of Rome as the corrector of heretics, and thus began the time of the papal or the Roman Catholic persecution, the Dark Ages. Friends, are you following me? Yes. So we have a starting point for this 538 from a 538 AD. So let's go forward now. 1,260 years of papal supremacy. It takes us to what? 1798. So the word of God says in Revelation 13 verse 5 that this beast with the seven heads and ten horns rise onto the sea will have a period of dominance starting from 538 AD to 1798 42 prophetic months which is 1,260 years. Are we good so far? Yes. Then the word of God goes on to explain. Revelation 13, verse 3 and verse 10 says, verse 3 says, and I saw one of his head as it was what? Wounded yes. to death. Yes. So does the Bible say that this system will let a wound? Yes. yes. It goes on, verse 10 says, and he leadeth, he that leadeth into captivity shall be what? Let go into captivity and he that killeth with a sword yes. must be killed with a sword. So one of these heads is going to get a mortal wound with a sword. Now, in the past, we sometimes confuse the meaning of the sword. But let's understand the sword in the context. Alright, so in the past, we said before, we know that the sword represents the word of God. But does that apply here? There's another sword that applies here. Let's let the word of God bring the clarity here. So, Romans 13, verse 3 and 4. Romans chapter 13, verse 3 and 4, giving us the right application of which sword is going to apply the wound to this beast. For who? Rulers. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but the evil. Will thou then not be afraid of, of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister. Who is he, who is he here? The rulers, yes? Ruler. Of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he bear not the what? The sword. So the sword is the authority of the who? Ruler. Are you following, friends? The sword is the authority of the ruler. So let's apply that now. In 1798, he birthed here the ruler, the sword, who has a sword, the authority, made his entrance into Rome, abolished the papal government, 
That's the deadly, the deadly wound, wound and establish a secular one. That's historically sound. Encyclopedia Americana, the 1941 edition. Have we lost anyone so far? No. I hope not. So in 1798, at the end of the 260 years, the Roman Catholic Church state system had a deadly wound. But the wound was inflicted only on the political side. So was it still a church? Oh, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yes. No. So what we're saying here, 530 AD, the Justinian decree gave the power. The Roman church rose. Wow. 1260 prophetic years of reigning. And in 1798, the Pope was taken captive by the ruler who bear the sword of authority, Berthier. All right. We're going to move now to Revelation 13. I want to focus on verse 11 to 18. And I want us to pay attention, even the kids to pay attention. Pay attention, kids. Those folding up paper stuff can wait afterwards. Pay attention. You will have to me have to preach this message. I'm being serious. Put those away now. You guys can fold it another time. Pay attention. Learn what you can learn now. Revelation chapter 13, verse 11, describes another beast. So this says what? And I be another what? Another beast. So you call it a what? A second beast. Agreed? Yes. Coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a what? A lamb. lamb. So two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. <laughs> now this is a summative slide, and it's, this slide is going to be explained by what's going to come afterwards. So, second beast has two horns like a lamb. What does these horns mean? Well, let the Bible explain. Psalms 8 and verse 17 says, For thou art the glory of their strength, and their favor or our horn shall be. Exhausted. So the horn represents what? Strength. So horn in the Bible prophecy are a symbol of strength. As we learned before, that a beast represents a what? A kingdom. A kingdom. So we see another kingdom rising now, and it's distinguished by two what? Horns, which are two systems of strength. strength. Are we good so far? Yes. All right, so. The second beast, we said, as a horn, but horns like a, a lamb. lamb. Who is a lamb? Well, let's not guess. John 1, 29 says, The next day John see Jesus coming from unto him, and said, Behold the lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. So this new nation now rising up out of the earth has two distinguishing strength that are lamb-like, that are Christ-like. Are you following so far? Yes. Are Christ-like. Well, what are these two distinguishing strengths? Well, Christ said in Matthew 22, verse 21. This is what Christ said. Ready. This is the Lamb speaking now. He says, Render to Caesar the things that belongs to Caesar. So Caesar represents the what? State. Ready. Are you following? Yes. And to God the things which are our gods. That represents the what? The church. So Jesus Christ, the Lamb, has established a principle that says church and state must be what? Separate. Separate. Is that biblical? Yes. Yes. So this nation rising up out of the earth with two distinguishing features of strength that are separate, the arms are separate, church and state is separated. That's a lamb-like principle that's spoken by the lamb himself in Matthew 22, verse 21, Jesus Christ. So republicanism, one nation under God, a nation without a king, one horn, and the next horn, protestantism, one church under God, a church without a pope. Let me clear, clear, clear. Republicanism is not the same as the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Republicanism simply means the power is with the people. Yes. So don't associate republicanism with the Republican Party. They have nothing, no relationship with each other. Are we good friend, friends? Yes. So republicanism... I have no relationship with the Republican Party, like the East and the West. We're talking about Republicanism now. So the principles is that Republicanism, the power is with the people, and the next principle is Protestantism. A church without a pope, one church under God. Now, so the second beast we can clearly identify to be with which, with which nation? The United States of America. That's the nation that's built on the principles of separation of church and state. Mm -hmm. So, these principles are enshrined in the First Amendment. And the First Amendment says, of the Bill of Rights, states that 
Congress represents the what? State shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or the church. Are you seeing that, friends? So, Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Now, no law means no law. No law doesn't mean that one law that favors another more than the other. No law doesn't mean that one law that applies to everybody. No law means no law. Do we get that, brethren? Yes. Because there seems to be some confusion amongst us sometimes. I'm not sure why. What? No law is pretty clear. No law means no law. So it doesn't mean that you can make a law that favors everybody. No law. Does it mean that you make a law that disenfranchises everybody? No law. Does it mean that you have a law that benefits some and not the others? It means no law means what? No. no law. So this First Amendment can be seen as a separation between what? Church, Church and state. Did Christ establish that principle in Matthew 22, verse 21? Yes. Render to Caesar that it belongs to? Caesar. And belong to God that belongs to? No. No. So we see when the papacy rose 530 AD and fell 1798, 1776, the United States of America rose as the second beast. The lamb like the, the beast with it with the two horns like a lamb. Now, so the first beast will say the Roman Catholic Church state system. And the second beast is the United States of America. Are we good so far? Yeah. Yes. Now, let's press on. Revelation 13, verse 14 talks about a change that's coming that's with us even right now. It says, Say to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had a wound by a sword and did live. Which beast had a wound by a sword? The first or the second beast? First. The first beast had a wound by a sword. So therefore, Revelation 13, verse 14 is really saying, make an image to the beast, which merely means... That is, the second beast, which is the what? The USA. USA should make an image to the first beast, the papacy, or the Roman Catholic Church state system. Yes. Are we good so far? Yes. We're pretty good so far, right? Yes. So the second beast is going to make an image that looks like the what? First beast. So the second beast, the USA, making an image to the first beast, the papacy, or the Roman Catholic Church state system. So, question. <coughs> what is the image of the beast? Let's not guess. The Great Controversy, page 445, says... The image to the beast represents that form of apostate Protestantism. But that form of apostate Protestantism has a certain look to it. Mm -hmm. Hear how it looks. Which will be developed when the Protestant church shall seek the aid of the civil power for the enforcement of our dogma. So therefore, the image of the beast, of the beast is the apostate Protestantism forming a what? Church, church state, union. union. Are you surprised by that? No, you shouldn't be surprised because the image of the, the first beast looked like was a what? Church state system. Mm -hmm. So the second beast is going to form an image to so the first beast. It must be a what? Church, church state system formed yeah. just the same. All right? So we're not surprised. Nothing surprising. Now, how is it that this image of the beast is going to be formed? The Bible tells us. It says, say to them that will on the earth that they should make an image to the beast. So it's true speaking that an image to the beast is going to be formed. So what does speaking mean or saying mean in Bible interpretation? Let's not guess. Great Controversy 442, the first paragraph tells us. The speaking of the nation is the action of its legislative and judicial authority. So a nation speaks by making what? Laws. laws. So the second beast will have to speak by making laws to form an image to the what? First beast. So the second beast will have to speak by making laws to create a church state system like the first beast. Yes. Does that make sense? Yes. All right, let's press on. So I'm going to give some historical account now to put this in context. All right, so I'm going to talk some history now. Listen carefully. Diplomatic relationship existed with the Pope in his capacity as head of state of the papal states from 1848 under President James Pollock to 1867 under President Andrew Johnson. These relationships lapsed when on February 28, 1867, Congress passed legislation. legislation. So did Congress pass a law? Yes. When? 1867. And what did that law do? That prohibited any further funding to the United Nations diplomatic missions to the Holy See. Mm -hmm. So in 1867, Congress passed a law so there must be no ambassadorial relationship between the United States of America and the Roman Catholic Church state system. Are you good so far? Yes. 
So that law stayed in effect from 1867 until, until 1984. Mm -hmm. And this was mentioned here in the New York Times. U.S. and Vatican restore full ties after 117 years. From 1867 to what? 1984. Hear what it says now. The United States and the Vatican established full diplomatic relations today for the first time in 117 years. The step announced here at the Vatican this morning was described by a spokesman for the Reagan administration as intended to improve communications at a time when Pope John Paul II has become increasingly involved in international affairs. Now, listen carefully now. Same article, I'm giving you a historical account of what occurred in 1984. This senator now speaking. So the senator here named Ernest Hollins, Democrat of the South Carolina and a candidate for his party's presidential nomination, said he would oppose elevating the special representative to the rank of ambassador. Here is why he said it's in violation of the first amendment, amendment and sets apart. We got a Yes. So in 1984, this senator said this plan to normalize ambassador relationship with the papacy is an act of breaking the first amendment yes. and establish a bad one. Precedent, right? No. The establishment of food and ties with the Vatican was made possible by a move by Congress last year that was 1984 in the context lifted a prohibition on diplomatic relations enacted in 1867. So, let's go further now. Congress repealed the 1867 ban. Mm -hmm. So that means that Congress would have passed a what? A law. a law. So Congress passed a law or speak. Didn't we learn that image of the beast is going to be formed by what? Saying to them, speaking. Yes? Yeah. So Congress passed a law, speak, in 1984 that repealed the 1867 ban on ambassadorial relationship with the Roman Catholic Church system. And the precedent for a church state union was established in 1984. And here this gentleman, William Wilson, the first U.S. ambassador to the Vatican, is greeted by Pope John Paul at the Vatican in 1985. President Donald President Ronald Reagan named Wilson as the first ambassador to the Vatican in 1984. Oh, wow. So was the president set for a church state to do that before? Oh, yeah. Yes. Is that in violation of the First Amendment? Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> now, what are the steps in making an image to the beast? And notice where I want you guys to really pop yourself up and pay attention. Now, what I'm going to say beyond here, I'm not discussing things in our own time. So everything I give you so far is historical. So what I'm going to be saying from here is going to be names and faces that you recognize and you know. You have to make some decisions today. So what are the steps in making an image to the beast? Well, let the great controversy 445 first paragraph give us some insight. And listen to what the inspired word says. When the leading churches of the United States uniting upon such points of doctrine as are held by them in common, do these two things. So when the leading churches come together and accomplish these two things, the image of the Roman hierarchy will be formed. Are you following me so far? Yeah. What are these two things? Shall influence the state to enforce their decrees. So when these leading churches come together and they have influence on the United States government, to push the decree or the belief or the value system of the churches, first step, and the second step is to what? To sustain their institutions, meaning there must be some monetary what? Benefit from the relationship between the what? Church and state. When that's been formed, what, what, is, what, what have you formed? An image. An image to the Roman what? Have I lost anybody? No. All right, so let's go through them systematically now. So the two steps in making an image to the beast, leading churches influence the USA to enforce the decree, and the leading churches are sustaining their institutions by the USA. Is that correct interpretation? Oh, yes. yes. All right, let's go to it now. First one, leading churches influence the USA to enforce the decree. 
I'm quoting from Huffington Post on the issue of religion in 2011. Mm. Religious lobbying groups have dramatically increased in Washington. Mm -hmm. First, they were discussing the leading churches influencing the USA to enforce their decree. Yes. Religious lobbying groups have dramatically increased in Washington. So what's a religious lobbying group? These are organizations which can be a single church or multiple churches coming together mm -hmm. and they have a sway or influence the Congress mm -hmm. to pass certain laws or recognize certain laws. Mm -hmm. are, are you following me so far? Yes. It's called lobbying. Mm -hmm. Lobbying. Have you heard that word before? Oh, yes. yes. So here's what this, 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 uh, this, this um, reporter says. With heated nationwide arguments in recent years, over issues ranging from same-sex marriage to abortion rights, it's no secret that the one. Religious organizations play a significant role in influencing nations. Does that meet the first criteria? Oh, yes. Absolutely. So this issue of religious lobbying meets the first criteria. Where the leading churches influencing the state to pass the church's decree. I'm going to mention just quickly, two of these religious lobbying groups. First one is the Christian Coalition. The Christian Coalition was founded in 1989 by Pat Robinson. The declared intent of the Christian Coalition is our efforts do not stop with voter guys. We actively lobby Congress and the White House on numerous issues. Does that mean the first criteria? Oh, yes. yes. Another group I want to mention to you, the Ten Commandments Commission. The Ten Commandments Commission has launched a campaign to press the Senate. Senate to adopt resolution to officially recognize the Ten Commandments in American society. Mm -hmm. Is that consistent with the first criteria? Yes. Is that, has that been done already? Mm -hmm. You don't answer me. Mm -hmm. Is the first criteria being fulfilled as, yes. as yet? Yes. 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 Let's discuss now the second criteria to sustain their institutions. Leading churches are sustained by in the institutions by the USA. So let's go back to some historical account for it to make sense to you. In 1984, St. Linda Johnson slipped an amendment. 1954, sorry. 1954, St. Linda Johnson slipped an amendment called the 501C3 Corporation on the end of the Ways and Means Bill approving funds for use by not-for-profit agencies. Let me, let me explain to you what, what this is about. So in 1954, St. Linda Johnson was campaigning and he was getting some bad press from churches in Texas. So he wanted us to silence the churches. So he slipped this amendment onto this bill that dealt with taxes and tax and how money should be handled as it relates to tax. But the trick was this. When the churches signed on to this 501c3, they were able to get some tax exemption. But it limited what they could say from the pulpit. Right. You got that version? You got that phrase? Yeah. Yeah. So he was getting some bad press from the churches, from the pulpit. Mm -hmm. And he says, you know what, I'm going to silence you guys. Mm -hmm. I am going to be able to put this in the law so it's sustaining institutions in terms of a tax break, but you must not keep what? By law. And that's exactly what he did. Corporations is a business, 501CG corporations is a business corporation and an instrument of the government organized with privileges of what? Tax exemption. And it's called it Johnson Amendment. What is it, what is it called? Johnson, Johnson Amendment. Amendment. No. Churches, like other non profit organizations, have the option to apply for a special tax exemption status called the 501c3. They are called so because of the provision in the tax code called what? Johnson, Johnson Amendment. Amendment. No. What are the benefits do a 501c3 church? enjoy when they are a part of the Johnson Amendment or the 501c3. It can receive grants from private foundations and the government. It is exempt from many federal, state, and local taxes. It can provide a tax deduction to individual donors. It may receive special postage rates, non-profit advertising rates, and other discounts. It receives limited protection from lawsuits. So are there benefits to the 501c3? Yes. But yes. Well, what are the drawbacks or limitations? Well. There can be some political activity, like advocating and lobbying for legislation, is accepted. However, it prevents endorsement and campaigning for or, for or against candidates from the pulpit. <coughs> Praise the God. Yes. So when your church is on the 501c3, they can't campaign from the pulpit. Right. And it also prevents the politicians from receiving tax deductible finances from churches. 
So the churches can't put their money in the what? Coffers of the political parties. Right. Well, in March of 20, 2006, the Bush administration, through an executive order, encouraged churches to incorporate. So there was a massive outreach to the churches mm -hmm. in 2006 under President Bush mm -hmm. to get the churches incorporated. And many churches were incorporated. There was an active going out to seek churches to be incorporated. Mm -hmm. And here's the actual executive order here. Responsibilities of the Center for Faith-Based and Community Initiatives in carrying out the purpose set forth in Section 2 of this order, the Center shall be coordinate a comprehensive departmental effort to what? Yeah. Incorporate faith-based and other community organizations in department programs and initiatives to the greatest extent possible. Mm -hmm. So the plan by the Bush administration in 2006 was to get all the churches to what? Incorporate it. Are you following so far? Yeah. And they established a center for faith-based initiative. Mm -hmm. Well, here it is, the church, all these churches, the leading churches coming together and President Bush there, using the executive order, signing on to sustain these churches through what? Tax exemption. Wow. Are you following so far? Yeah. Well, in 2009, this went on steroids. Mm -hmm. Obama administration have elevated a faith-based initiative to a new what? White, White House office. It was first a what? Center is now a what? New White House office of faith-based partners, and he placed this pastor named Joshua Dubois to be the one to bring through this continued incorporation of the churches. Mm -hmm. And I'm reading now from the White House office of the press secretary, February 5, 2009. Joshua understands the issues at stake, knows the people involved, and will be able to bring everyone together from both the secular and the faith-based communities from academia and politics around common goals. Mm -hmm. And here is Joshua Dubois right here, and here are the leading churches applauding the sustenance being provided to the tax exemption of the 501c3 by President Obama as they further to extend these tentacles and pull more churches in on this new office of faith-based initiative. Yes. And an elevation from a center to an office within the White House. Yes. Are you following me so far? Yes. So, first requirement have been fulfilled. Second requirement have been fulfilled. So the image to the beast, the USA Church State Union, has been formed from 2009. So this thing about Adventists looking to fancy, when is the image of the beast going to be formed? Done. done already. Mm -hmm. Two requirements have been met. Wow. Friends, are we clear? Yes. yes. The leading churches are being sustained. Yes? yes. We saw that? And the leading churches are now getting their voices heard in terms of this lobbying process. Yes. So the image to the beast is formed already. The church in the background there and the state in the foreground here. Church state union has been established already from 2009. So the creation of the image to the beast, the USA, Church State Union with precedents established in 1984, saying to them, You know that law that repealed the 1867 ban? Yeah. But the completion was established in 2009. I would say it was started from 2006 and got more strength, and by 2009 it was all fully established. But the Word of God says the image of the beast is going to be formed, but it's going to require what? Life. Get the concept, friends. The image of the beast is formed, but it must have what? Life. life. So it's formed. So how is it going to get life now? Revelation 13 and 15 says, And he had power to give what? Life, life to the image of the beast, wow. that the image of the beast should both speak and cause. Mm. So the image of the beast is formed already, mm -hmm. but what does it require? Life. life. Power to give it what? Oh, life. Boy. Well, then came this person. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yes. The 2016 presidential elections and Trump courting evangelicals. Yes. But he was going nowhere. He was getting nowhere. Mm -hmm. He was trying to win over the evangelicals, but he was getting nowhere. And two men came to his rescue. Mm -hmm. A gentleman by the name of Bill Dallas from United in Purpose, 
He's one of his conservative religious organization. Another man who came to his rescue was Dr. Ben Carson, who was then the national chairperson for My Faith Votes. So these two men came together and they proposed a plan of action to the then candidate Trump. And the plan of action was to have a meeting where the evangelists would meet with Trump. And they met somewhere in New York. Several hundreds, over a thousand of these evangelical leaders met with the then candidate and they were able to rap with him and ask him questions. So what was blocking the church pastors from opening doors in Trump from their pulpits and treasury? 501c3. Because it prevents endorsement and campaign or against candidates from the pulpit and it prevents politicians from receiving tax deductible finances from the churches. So when he was rapping with them, he realized that that was a problem. So he realized that the Christians are the most powerful lobbyist group. Mm -hmm. So he started doing something very interesting. Mm -hmm. He started making some promises. Yes. yes, I heard it. And this is Newsmax. Trump to evangelicals. I'm going to give the churches their voice, voice back. back. What are the prophecies? <laughs> he should have power to give light to him. So he be the one. Speak and cause. So what does he say is going to give them back now? Give them their voice back. So addressing the 11th annual gathering of the Conservative Washington Conservative Values Voter Summit in Washington, the GOP nominee, that's in 2006, September, that's before the election. The election was November of 2016. Are you following me, friends? Yeah. So in September 2016 now, he's speaking to this this GOP um, uh, conservative group, and he said he would, the first thing he would do is give our churches there, and he had power to give life unto the middle of the beast, the middle of the beast does what? Speak. Wow. Alright, then he goes on. Exclusive, Donald Trump tells Brodefile, I want to give power back to the churches. That was February of that year. In an exclusive interview with Brodefile, Donald Trump wants to see Christian pastors what? Speak, Speak more boldly from them. Because he sees it, as he sees it, the church has to have more power. So I said, the first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to give you pastors power so you might what? Speak. And speak from where? The pulpit. He goes on by saying, they have taken a lot of the power away from the church. I want to give power back to the church. I want pastors and ministers to be able to get up and speak. Image of the beast, you must do what? Get up and speak. speak. So he wants to give life back to the church. And here he goes on. I want pastors and ministers to be able to get up and speak on behalf of Christianity. And they are afraid to do it right now because they don't want to lose their tax exempt status. We will take care of that. So did he see what the problem was? Yeah. Yes. Did he, did he recognize that that was the issue? Yeah. So he made a pledge. Donald Trump vows to totally destroy Johnson Amendment that stops churches funding political parties. And you see what he says here now? In September of 2016, imagine what our country could accomplish if we started working together as one people under one God. This is my promise to all of you. Starting in 2017, we will be one American nation. Wow. Under God. That's what he says. Yeah. So, the blessing. <laughs> they lay hands on him and they blessed him. Yes. They gave him their blessing and they voted for him. <clears throat> White evangelical voters, Donald Trump, 81%. Hillary Clinton, 16%. White evangelical voters helped give Trump victory. Mm -hmm. The other reason why he won. Yes. Yep. Yeah. So then it was fully said. Trump takes power. And he had power to give what? Light. Light to the image of the beast. And here it was payback time now. Mm -hmm. So May of 2017, he's going to fulfill his obligation that he promised. President Trump signs an executive order aimed at easing an IRS rule, a 501c3, limiting political activity for religious organizations. You friends, you got that? So in May of 2017, he signed an executive order by his power. That's not by law. That's not by speaking. Right. By his what? Power. Executive power. 
which lessens the higher risk from having contention with churches who choose to what? Support political candidates from their pulpit. He eases that by his executive order. That is 2017. May 2017. The following year, 2018. President Donald Trump announced Thursday, May 3rd, 2018, a new initiative that aims to give faith-based groups a stronger what? Voice. Voice through what? Federal, Federal government. And he had power to give what? Life. So he may what? Speak. 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 Faith-based groups have stronger voice through the federal government and provide recommendations, administrations, policies. And here, in May 3rd, 2018, it's been signed in the Rose Garden, and something interesting occurred. President Trump shakes hands with Pastor Darius Scott, co-founder of the New Spirit Revival Center, before Trump signs an executive order during an event in the Rose Garden, Thursday, May 3rd, 2018. And it was ratified with one of the most impressive Masonic handshakes yeah. I've ever seen. Yeah. It was ratified by one of the most impressive Masonic handshakes I've ever seen between this pastor and the president. And this was ratified, see, churches, pastors, you're going to have more power, you're going to get your voice back. So you can have actually even speak on cars. Mm -hmm. That was 2018. And Paula White's comments in 2018 about this executive order signed by the president was, this order is a historic action, strengthening the relationship between faith and government. But I thought the First Amendment says yeah. Congress shall make no law. Mm -hmm. There must be no relationship. And the product will be countless lives transformed or transformed lives and then 2019 just four months ago or three months ago in mm -hmm. november paula white had trump's faith office and she got a seat at the very table mm -hmm. friends are you understanding this yeah, yes. so does the image of the beast now does it as life to speak yes. oh you better believe it and this is a very interesting cartoon that I'd like to show. It showed Trump and evangelicals. Now, I'm not saying that the president have another relationship. I would never say that. You guys are not listening to me. Apostate Protestantism have formed a USA Church State Union and have received life to influence the USA legislative process. So, we're moving on. Revelation 30 verse 6 says what? And he called it all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their what? Right hand right or in their foreheads. Wow. What's the mark of the beast? Mm -hmm. Well, let's, let me let, 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 let have some help here now. From the, the very horse's mouth. Sunday is our mark of authority. The church is above the Bible and this transference of Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. The Catholic record of London in 1923. Mm. So the papacy... The Roman Catholic Church says it's about their own mouth says the mark of the beast is what? Sunday. Sunday observance. And they say it and the SD Bible commentary echoes that point here. When the test comes, it will be clearly shown what the mark of the beast is. It's the keeping of Sunday. Mm -hmm. So those who are keeping the Sunday right now have not experienced the mark of the beast. No. But a time is going to come when it's going to be enforced. Yes. And if you keep Sunday then, in contrast to God's seven-day Sabbath, you'd have received the what? The mark. mark of the beast. No. And this mark of the beast is in contradistinction to the what? Fourth commandment, which is the seed of God. So there's a battle here going on, friends. The mark of the beast versus the what? Seed of God. And the seed of God is found in, in the fourth commandment. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall thou labor and do all thy work. But the seven days is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God, that's God's name, in it thou shalt not do any work, nor thou nor thy son or thy daughter, neither man servant nor thy maid servant, nor thy cattle nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord what? Made. Made. He's the creator. Heaven and earth is jurisdiction. So the name, the titan jurisdiction is in the seal. It's the fourth commandment. And that's in opposition to the Sunday 
issue on the Sunday controversy. Are you following me, brethren? Yes. yes. So the seed of God, the fourth commandment, is name the Lord your God. He titled the Creator and His territory heaven and earth. All official seeds contain those three important features. Now, how will there be a son a enforced observance of Sunday? How will this come about? Well, let's not guess. Last events, page 129, four paragraph says, Satan puts his interpretation upon things, on, upon events, and they think as he would have them that the calamities which fill the land, so these tornadoes, these earthquakes, these fires that's decimating places yes, like Australia. Friends, are you following? Yes. All these calamities that are going on. Yes. Satan is involved in it, and now he puts his interpretation on it now. <laughs> no, so he goes on now saying, Thinking to appease the wrath of God, these influential men make laws enforcing Sunday. I wonder who these influential men are. You call them what? Legislators. Yeah. Yes? Yeah. You call them the lawmakers. Mm -hmm. So all that we're seeing going on in the world now with all this calamity is tickling these men of influence to want to what? Enforce Sunday. Why? Because they're saying that what? It's through Sunday breaking why are we seeing these environmental disasters? Mm -hmm. And who are the loudest voice amongst them? This man. So this man here came out with an encyclical called Laudatosi, or on care for or common home. It was an encyclical that spoke about the environment. Mm -hmm. And it's linking the environment and all the calamities that we're seeing or we'll see and to see with a need for Sunday rest and Sunday observance. Mm -hmm. And here how oh, it's subtly coached now. Subtly coaching this one. This is what he says. Yes. Sunday, right. this is the actual reading of the number 237 from the actual encyclical. Mm -hmm. Sunday, like the Jewish Sabbath. <laughs> I never heard about such thing as a Jewish Sabbath. I thought the Sabbath was of all men. Yes. Yes. About those men about those yes. So Sunday, like the Jewish Sabbath, is meant to be a day which heals our relationship with God with ourselves and with others, with the world. And with the world. This is an interesting concept. It, each Sunday protects human action from becoming empty activism. Each Sunday also prevents that unfettered greed and sense of isolation which make us seek personal gain to the detriment of all else. The law of weekly rest forbade work on the seventh day. Mm -hmm. I thought I was subtle. Yeah. Mm. Rest opens our eyes to the larger picture and gives us renewed sensitivity to the rights of others. Here it is now, friends. And so the day of rest, centered on the Eucharist, I thought it, it was centered on the rest that we found finding Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Sheds its light on the whole week and motivates us to greater concern for what? Nature. Nature and the poor. There the environment piece is just nicely stuck in. Yeah. Yeah. So all these calamities... The voice is going to echo and say it's because of what? Sunday breaking. Yeah. And the Pope himself, in his own writing, have made that declaration in this encyclical. And when this begets a louder voice, as it's starting to get, Great Contrast 615, second paragraph says, as the Sabbath has become the special point of controversy throughout Christendom, and religious and secular authorities have combined to what? Yeah. Enforce the observance of Sunday, the persistent refusal of a small minority. I wonder what you call them what? Mm -hmm. Seventh-day Adventists. Yeah. You call them Bible-believing Seventh-day Adventists. Yeah. Yeah. Not Seventh-day Adventists who are nominal mm -hmm. in name only. Yes. All right? To yield to the popular demand will make them objects of universal execution. Universal hatred. Mm -hmm. Now, question. So we learned so far that the image of the beast is found. We learned so far the image of the beast is getting strength to speak. Yes? Yes. And we have learned so far what the mark of the beast is. And we have learned so far it's going to come from an issue of the environment and calamities and people are going to push for the son of law. But we're asking the question now. For the enforcement of a son of national son of law, they will require a change in the what? First Amendment. Must be official change in the First Amendment. Mm -hmm. Right? It says Congress shall make what? No, no, law. no law. And so we were instructed. Yes, we know there's a separation between church and state. The First Amendment is a wall of separation. 
But there are plans to amend the USA Constitution. How so? We were told from as early as 1888 in the review, December 1888. We see the efforts are being made to restrict our religious liberties. The Sunday question is now assuming large proportions. If even larger proportions, no, is that so? Yes. yes. An amendment to our constitution. constitution is being urged in Congress, and when it is obtained, oppression must follow. I wonder which of the, uh, the, the amendment, the first, second, or third, what do you guys think? The first amendment is going to be what? Change. An amendment to our constitution. Which is the constitution that speaks about religious issues? The first. She goes on in, in, in December 24, 1889, from the review extra. If the people, if the who, friends? The if the people can be led to favor a Sunday law, mm -hmm. so the people can be stirred up to say, because we, because we're breaking Sunday, that's why all we having three hurricanes coming to Florida, one behind the other. Yeah. Why we have fired California for, 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 for three months straight. That's true. That's true. And all the problems going on in, in this country and the world is because of Sunday breakage. Yes. When the people can let to believe that, then the clergy know. Mm -hmm. Then the clergy know who now have the strength, who already have the ears of the what? The government already. Through this pillow talk, mm -hmm. yeah, the clergy intend to exert a united influence to obtain a religious amendment to the constitution and compel the nation to keep Sunday. Mm -hmm. So, why am I showing you this picture now of the Supreme Court and the, the different Supreme Court judges? I want us to count. So, these are the Supreme Court judges, and this is their religion Brett Kavanaugh, Catholic. Clarence Thomas, Catholic. John Roberts, Catholic. Samuel Alito, Catholic. Sonia Sotomayor, Catholic. And Neil Gorsuch, he was raised a Catholic, but he now claims to be an Episcopalian. So there are five Catholics out of the nine. Is that a majority? Oh, yes. So if there's going to be a change in the amendment, do you think it's going to require a situation where the Supreme Court is pro-Catholic? Yes. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And so we see in this article, we'll explain to you what was going on behind the scene that we didn't know. Yes. So it says, we'll borrow worried theocracy. Why didn't we know this until now? So this, this, this journalist now making a very interesting plea, January of this year, recently she said this. The Attorney General has gradually revealed his terrifying agenda. Who knew and why was this concealed so long? Listen now. So is it, she's explaining now, why was it that Gorsuch and Kavanaugh, why were they added to the Supreme Court? As it happens, some very important people in legal circles are true believers themselves. The man most responsible for putting Gorsuch and Kavanaugh on the court, as well as more than 100 lower court judges, is the Federalist Society, Leonard Leo. He is a member of the ultra-conservative Catholic organization, which is called? Opus Dei. So Opus Dei man was in the background, mm -hmm. That we couldn't see, mm -hmm. and we got caught up in this whether or not he was a molester when he in his younger years, oh, yeah. or he was a drunk, if he looked like beer or not. Nonsense. Mm -hmm. Distraction. Yes. Really, she was going to be on the scene. Yes. Oh, because they was there, what? Shifting the plans of time mm -hmm. and setting up their agenda. Mm -hmm. This man, Leonard Leo, was the one behind the scene as a Catholic, shaping the part mm -hmm. of history. And he goes on, and has served on the board as his affiliate, the Catholic Information Center, whose goal is to influence and convert members, members of the political elite. Mm -hmm. And who have been converted already? Mm -hmm. Among the converts are Larry Kudlow, Trump's economic advisor and former speaker of the house, Newt Gingrich. Mm -hmm. So the Opus Dei is actively converting persons of some political clout to Catholics. Mm -hmm. And they have put these two important Supreme Court judges on the Supreme Court. And these two have ensured a what? Majority. Mm -hmm. Five out of nine. So there we are. Five out of nine is a majority. And an extra person that was raised as a Catholic. Mm -mm. No. William Barnow, our present Attorney General, is expressing his philosophy in terms of what government must look like. Mm -hmm. Listen to what he says. William Barr, the Attorney General of the United States, has also served on the board of the Catholic Information Center. Mm -hmm. 
Although Ross Day has officially denied that he's a member, just as the political and media establishment inconveniently looked over the bar's long-term commitment to the what? Unitary. Unitary executive theory. Very interesting. Yeah. Unit mean one. Executive mean the personal executive power. Theory is a belief system. So what is he saying? William Barr believed that the executive power must be established in how many persons? One, One person. Are we surprised at what we're seeing going on right no. now? No. Mm -hmm. President speaks, this man drums. Yes. Sure. Don't get caught up about this so-called rebuttal and all this thing. No, that's it's nonsense. Stage. That's a distraction. That's a stage yeah. nonsense. Yes. Yeah. He knows who his boss is and he's, he's playing his part very well. That's his philosophy. No. Listen what they say now about what his long-term vision is. He, his, that's William Barr, views are what Catherine Stewart and Carlin Fredrickson identified in a New York Times op-ed as religious what? Nationalism. Nationalism, which basically implies either a theocratic state or a single religion, religion state. state. My Lord. Now, we're going to go a little further now. So, Revelation 13, verse 16. Are we keeping them so far? Oh, yes. yes. No. He says, and he calls it all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a what? Mark, Mark in their right hand right or in the what? Their forehead. Right. So the second beast will have some power to cause or enforce them. Mm -hmm. That um, the mark is placed in other the one. Right hand or in the what? The forehead. No, the, right, the mark in the right hand is, is coarse observance of Sunday because of the needs of daily life. Yeah. The hands represents what? Working. Activities of daily life, working. So you need to work to pay your bills, to feed your family. So you can receive the mark through your intent to act contrary to God's law. Mm -hmm. Are you seeing that, friends? Yes. Or mark in the forehead, willful, mindful observance of Sunday. The forehead is the frontal lobe where you make executive decisions. Yes. So persons willingly decide to go contrary to God's commandment, God's Sabbath commandment. No. It goes on to say, and that no man might what? By ourselves. Say he that have the mark or the name of his, the beast or the number of his name. So there must be a system in place mm -hmm. that can make a distinction that some can buy and some can't buy. Yeah. That distinction is found in a cashless society. Oh, yeah. Because if I have cash and you have cash, we both can buy. Mm -hmm. So it must be a system where it can't be based on cash. Because it must be a system to distinguish me as a Sabbath keeper from someone else who's not a Sabbath keeper. Yeah. All right? So I want to discuss now establishing a cashless world currency. As I said to you guys, I'm, this is not an ECOP or a knee-jerk response I'm giving you. I've been studying these things well over 13 years. As I've shown you before, much of what I'm presenting has been written before. In shadows, it's much clearer now, so I'm confident to present it now. I was shy for over 10 years to present, present it. Shyness is gone. So what's the plan? in place to establish a cashless society to enforce the no buy no sell decree. Friends, are you following me so far? Yes. Well, the Economist, one of the most world-renowned economic magazine, in January 9th of 1988, said get ready for our world currency. And listen to how they describe the world currency coming about. They describe a picture here with paper money Going up in what? Flames, Flames and uprising a what? Phoenix with a token around its neck that says 2018. Wow. You got a friend? Yeah. So in 1988, they were planning that in 30 years' time, the system must be in place for paper money to what? To be irrelevant mm -hmm. and be transferred to a system that is a token based system mm -hmm. and is expected to be established by when? 2018. Alright? So are you following me so far? Yes. No. Then we had this financial crisis in 2008. Very interesting crisis. Why did this come about? Why was this? Was it something said to implode intentionally or was it just accidental? Let us see. Well, the financial crisis of 2007-2008, also known as the global financial crisis of, and the 2008 financial crisis, is considered by many economists to have been the worst financial crisis since the Great Depression of the 1930s. It began in 2007, I will understand, right? We know that there was a subprime mortgage 
issues, full-blown international banking crisis with the collapse of the investment bank, the Lehman Brothers, in September 15 of 2008. Now, what's interesting is this. The Lehman Brothers is one of the banks of which, which, of which, which conglomerate? The Federal Reserve. You got that, friends? The Lehman Brothers, I want you to get the point in our friends. The Lehman Brothers Bank is a part, was a part of the Federal Reserve. Mm -hmm. So who, who owned Lehman Brothers? Federal. Federal Reserve. It was a part, one, of the, one of the banks in, in the cartel. Mm -hmm. yeah. So or could it be that they intentionally allowed this bank to implode? No, Let us see. The Wall Street Journal. Christ and Wall Street as Lehman Totters married six by AIG Hunts for cash. So there's no liquidity in the market. No, a very interesting article I found, this was in 2009. This is when I found, first found this article. In my continued search, brethren. This is not a hiccup I'm giving you guys. This is years of dedicated study and searching on my part. As the Lord guided me. And I found this article. I put everything in perspective. In response, so this is from Ambrose Evans Pichard. The G20 moves the world a step closer to a global currency. And it's from the Telegraph, April 3rd, 2009. In response to the world financial crisis, following the 2009 G20 summit, plans were announced for the creation of a what? New, New global, global currency to replace the US dollar as the world reserve currency. <laughs> so I wonder if in 2008 they allowed this collapse, so in 2009 they could set the place down, the pace down to push this agenda yeah. that was first mentioned in 1988 for world currency. Well, it's what you call it, a Galian dialectic. Oh, yeah. So yeah, the thesis, the Federal Reserve allows the collapse of Lehman Brothers. Yes, they did allow it. Mm -hmm. They established this subprime mortgage issue with these people buying houses who had poor credits. Yes. Mm -hmm. And they set, the, they set the date and the time to flip the switch. Mm -hmm. So if Lehman Brothers goes down, what is going to go down? Yeah. All these create this monetary crisis and allow a reception of no a world currency. So the thesis was that Lehman Brothers were, were low to collapse by the Federal Reserves, and the antis was the world financial crisis. And the thesis was what? Creation. Creation of a new global currency. And the new global currency is called the SDR, or Special Drawing Rights. Special Drawing Rights started as synthetic paper money and it transferred over to digital currency. We're going to get to that soon enough. There is now a world currency in waiting. In what, friends? In time, SDRs are likely to evolve into a parking place for the foreign owners of the central banks led by the People's Bank of China and Japan and the US. All right? And a few, and Britain and a few others. Follow me carefully now. So in 1980, 1988, the plan was for world currency. 2008, there was an intentional collapse of the Lehman Brothers to create a problem with liquidity in the markets and its financial collapses. So the following year, there will be a reception both within the G20 and the surrounding countries for a reception for our world reserve currency, the SDR, special joint rights. No. So the, this was established. So now they have a paper-based world currency, which they transferred to an electronic world currency, but they weren't satisfied. They wanted something to be done. And the IMF tasked the People's Bank of China that link digital currency with the world. Yes. Yes. Special drawing rights. I'm going to try and play this now. I hope it does play. And I want you to look at this very carefully what I'm going to play now. I really pray and trust that it plays. And you're going to see what they designed and what came in place.
But I've just played that video to show you what the IMF, the IMF instructed the People's Bank of China to establish so, some product that link digital currency with finance with the SDR. And I just showed it. Let's just look through some of the high points. So we saw a man running initially, and we saw gold and silver being the currency, yes? Yes. yes. Then we saw it start to run into this Masonic triangle. Yeah. And it says blockchain, the devil uses it to destroy the world. That's what is in fine print right here. Whoa. No, in Masonic language, the devil, the devil is good and Jesus is what? Bad. Oh, okay. So they're saying, you know, the devil uses it to destroy the world. So who's the devil here? Jesus, Jesus. that's what they're saying. And it says, the God uses it to the benefit of mankind. So who is the God here now? Satan. Satan. Mm -hmm. And it shows paper money being the currency. And then it brings the US dollar as the world reserve currency. Mm -hmm. Then it shows that digitalized and doing what? Swiping, Swiping away the US dollar as a paper based currency. Mm -hmm. And you're seeing what? The, the number of nodes is limited, but the resources, you're seeing all these digitalized. See, digitalized here, friends. You see what? Cell phones, computer, oil. Everything here, all commodities become what now? Digitalized. So friends, what was conceived in 1988, 30 years later, is now what? Established through the International Universal Digital Currency, SDRs. And what was seen here as a, seemed like a drill around the neck was really a token. A token in the system. The system is called blockchain technology. Friends, you heard that? Blockchain technology. Very important. Blockchain technology. So 30 years later, blockchain technology established where every commodity can be sold through what? Digitalized currency. Friends, are you getting that? Yeah. Now, let's continue. I said to you before that this is not some fictitious discussion. That the system is up in operation already. So here is this article I found very interesting. Futurism. First American seller owned by blockchain. Mm. Blockchain technology. Are you following? Yes. So this lady named Chris Tenhauser reporting on the first person to actually use the system to actually buy and sell something. Me, the first American to sell her home using blockchain. She, this lady speaking now. This first deal makes it much easier for the rest of the 49 states to iterate the process. On February 20, 19, um, 20, 2018, right on time for the 30 year plan, yes. Vermont Manta Catherine Purcell did something extraordinary. She sold her home, and yes, people sell their homes every year, scores of them, but Purcell's sale was fundamentally different. There's a record of it on the blockchain. So she was able to sell her house using digitalized currency. Is that system with us? Mm -hmm. yes. It's with us and it's operational. Mm -hmm. China is using blockchain technology right now to buy and sell what? Tea. Mm -hmm. It's with us, friends. Yes. Now, gaining access to this cashless worst world currency. So the system is there using blockchain technology, the ACCC chain, for digitalized buying and selling. But how are you going to gain access to it? Well, some commentary from me. It's important to recognize the distinction between the mark of the beast, observance of Sunday when the law is in force, and the actual enforcement of the mark to the no by no self decree. Friends, you got a distinction. Yeah. The distinction I'm, we're making here between the mark of the beast and how is the mark of the beast to be enforced. The mark of the beast will say Sunday what? Observance when it's been enforced. But how are you going to enforce a no by no sell decree? Therefore, when someone decides an act in obedience to the Sunday law, they receive the mark. The enforcement of this mark will involve a system that uses unique features of each individual. So it must be a system where if I'm with, if I'm with a system at the market, it means I can have access to it, but you can't what? You can't if you're on God's side. Are you following me, friends? Yes. So it must be a system that distinguishes me from you. Oh, right. So it can't be a credit card. Mm -hmm. Because I can steal your credit card and you can steal mine. Mm -hmm. God forbid, but you get the point I'm saying. Yes. So it must be something unique to me and something unique to what? You. you. And so we go to this presidential directive that was established in 2008. 
The use of biometrics is such a system and has been authorized by a presidential directive. NSPD 59 and HSPD 24. Please take a picture of that because you might think I'm, I'm, I'm blowing breeze. So from 2008, there's a presidential directive on the books that gives the power to the federal government to use people biometrics. Also, I'm going to read the actual directive, presidential directive. This is, not, this, is, this is the actual I'm reading now. This directive establishes a framework to ensure that federal executive departments, are you hearing that, friends? Mm -hmm. yeah. And agencies use mutually compatible methods and procedures yeah, right. in the collection, storage, yeah. use, analysis, and sharing of biometric and associated biographic and contextual information of individuals in a so supposedly lawful and appropriate manner. But who's going to make the law? They're going to make the law. Yeah. while respecting their information, privacy, and other legal rights under United States law. So NSPD 59 and HSPD 24 is on the books already as an executive order. So what are we seeing? Biometric technology, RFID chips, retinal scans, etc. is not the mark of the beast. Are you following my friends? Yes. That's not the mark of the beast, but they're going to be used to what? Enforce the mark of the beast to make a distinction between those who are with the system and those who are not with the system. However, biometrics will be used to enforce no buy no sell decree in a global system of a cashless society. So, already in Cairo, Cairo Amman Bank, that's in Egypt, they are already using retinal scans for you to access your paper money. Friends, are you following? Yeah. And here it is, friends. How does it work? The system here. It takes a picture of your blood vessels in your retina, which is distinct from each person. Mm -hmm. Nobody, no two persons retina is the same in terms of the blood vessel pattern. Mm -hmm. That's distinct. It's like a fingerprint. And also this RFID chip on the skin. And these are being used already, friends, to gain yes. access to different systems. Yes. Swedish company Epicenter implants microchips on the employees. Swedish commuters can use futuristic hand implant microchips as train tickets purchase. A microchip on this, your skin to pee. But it doesn't stop there, friends. It doesn't stop there. What a thing if we find that this biometrics actually enters the church. Oh. Christian Post Reporter, that's the magazine. Brandon Showalter, that's the... That's the the person who wrote it. Face and fingerprint scanning installed in churches as China increases surveillance. Yeah. You know, China, China is a very interesting of country. Course. Let me tell you why China is interesting. China is a technocratic society. Mm -hmm. And a technocratic society is the individual person's right doesn't really matter. Right. It's a system that matters. Yeah. So many of these systems are find their training ground in China. Mm -hmm. Because there's no laws to prevent it. Exactly. But it's what whatever you see being established in China is going to be replicated elsewhere. So in the churches in China, they actually already have face and fingerprint scanning installed in the churches. On October the 6th, New Yang Church, I, I seem to have forgotten the year for this, but it's a recent year, is the central province of Dubai, which is also the home of the two Chinese Christian councils of Anshai City, are two biometric devices set up on its second floor. Since then, congregation members have to stand in line to have their face and fingerprint scanned before being allowed to enter the church. Mm. I wonder if a time is going to come before we can enter church. We're going to need to have our fingerprint yes. and our retinal scan. So we have access to a system to know by no self. Mm -hmm. hmm. I wonder if this is coming to America. Of course. Oh. Facial recognition take goes to church. A new company is, and this is, Amer this is, this is in American context now. 2015. A new company is offering facial recognition technology to churches called Churchix, the organization that offshoot of Israeli biometrics company Scalcash, whose technology has been used in casinos, airports, and other security conscious deployments. I wonder the kind of thing I'm going to say, oh, people shoot down churches. Why we don't have a system where we know who's going to enter the church and see if they are for or against us. Yes, yes. I wonder, I'm just wondering. Mm -hmm. I wonder if Chinese is just laying this foundation that's going to be replicated elsewhere. 
Membership management, church membership management, the need to replace manual membership management. Biometric technology has recently proven to be the most effective and affordable solution for the safe and orderly management of member information. Fingerprint scanning capabilities limit the need for passwords, barcode readers, and identification cards. So, whenever someone, my commentary, whenever someone accepts and complies with four Sunday observance, they will register and activate a regional system of special drawing rights through the use of fingerprinting, retinal scans, or some other similar biometric technology. Friends, are you following me? Yes. So you have a world system of finite, so-called finite amount of trading opportunity, buying and selling. And you have to be a part of the system for you to have access to what? That system to buy and sell. Wow. So, question. It goes on. And Revelation 13, verse 17. Another one of about five minutes left. I'm wrapping up now. And that no man might buy or sell, save he that have the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So there's a system here with those who have the what? Mark or the what? The name, the name or the what? The number. So there's an hierarchy in having access to the system to buy and sell. Are you seeing that? Yes, yes. So, a number is mentioned. See? Mark. The name or the number. And that number we know is 666. Mm -hmm. Revelation 13, verse 18. I will learn that means vicarious for IDI, which is in Roman numerals 666. Are you following me, friends? Yes. yes. I will know that describes a man. Yes. Mm -hmm. Vicar. Vicarious, a substitute. Anti. Instead of. Vicar of Christ. Antichrist. And this is the Life magazine said using the word the Vicar of Christ. Mm -hmm. So the system now. At the past of national son law, all persons who transgress God's seven days Sabbath Saturday will receive the mark of the beast, but there will be an hierarchy among those who have been granted the access to buy or sell. Those with the mark, secular society. The name of the beast, apostate protestantism, and the number of his name, the papal system. Whoa. So everybody in the world will be in one of those categories. Wow. Got it. Everybody will be one of those categories. Either have the name, the mark, or the number of his name. And you'll have to use your biometric to what? Gain access to the system. Mm -hmm. So, what is going to come in place now to link the buy and sell with your identity? So the buy and sell we saw was the what? Blockchain system. Remember we discussed that? Yes. And we saw the biometrics was now the issue of what? Identity. So linking buy and sell with identity or linking what? Blockchain with what? Biometrics. So you must have a system to link both. In other words, a system that recognizes my uniqueness in my biometrics and I can use that to access the system of what? Where the resources lie, the block blockchain the technology. Mm -hmm. Friends, are you following me so far? Yes. Well, I found this very interesting article. Mm -hmm. Blockchain and biometrics, the future of identity. Whoa. And it's on a site called Very Mid. Found very interesting. May 25th, 2018. And this is what the person says. This man here, John Collard. Uh -huh. Long-term design is difficult, but not impossible. Indeed, standardization is likely to happen quickly, much as the internet itself appeared almost overnight. So he's talking about linking blockchain with biometrics. Are you following me, friends? Yes. When such convergence happens for identity, I predict that biometrics will become the primary method for linking you with identity claims on these blockchains. So he's saying a system looking like this is in the making. Where you have your different biometrics, your retinal scan, your fingerprint, your facial scan, your, 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 bar, your, 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 your chip in your hand scan, your voice recognition. Mm. And they are linked. So these here now are his identity. That's linking to the what? Blockchain is system of where you have the digitalized currency. Mm. Friends, are we following the message yes. so far? Yes. No, I didn't draw this. This is, this is what I, I took down from the internet. And this man is saying, this is what it's going to look like. So let's wrap it up now, friends. Revelation 13, 15 says, I know and say that and it's going to be a requirement to worship the image of the beast. Is that so, friends? Oh, yeah. oh, no. And worship the image of the beast says, now, whosoever transgresses the commandment of God in order to obey the teaching of, the, of, teaching of Rome, they are worshiping the beast and his image. So to worship the image of the beast means to be a part of the system of Sunday observance when it's been what? Enforced. Mm -hmm. yes. 
I will learn here that it goes on to not only a worship, but a what? Killed if you don't what? Worship the image of the beast. It will be urged that the few who stand in opposition to an institution of the church and a law of the state ought not to be tolerated. Yes. That it is better for them to suffer than for whole nations to be thrown into confusion and all this yes. Did that come to our God and yes. King? Yes. Oh yes. Mm -hmm. Great controversy 615, the second paragraph. Great controversy 631. Though a general decree has fixed the time when commandment keepers may be what? Put to death. Their enemies will in some cases anticipate the decree and before the time specified will deliver to what? Take their lives. But God says in Psalms 91, 1 and 2, He that dwelt in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My, my God, in Him will I trust. Amen. So yes, friends, they're going to be a death decree as the image of the beast apostate Protestantism have the power to speak and cause for this to come true. So in summer, friends, I'm wrapping up. I'm keeping my word. Last few slides. So the image of the beast, USA Church State Union, it is formed. Is that done already? Yes. Done. The image of the beast is given light to speak on cause. Is that been, been done? Yes. Done. Supreme Court is majority Roman Catholic. Is that done? Yes. Done. Political leaders leading towards a single religion and state. Is that done? Yes. Done. Global financial system digitalized SDR in place. Is that done? Yes. Done. Biometric technology available to enforce a no by no cell decree. Is that done? Done. Only one thing is left, friends. What is next? No, no. National Assembly Law is coming soon, friends. Friends, I, as I stand to you, that with you, speaking to you, I'm showing you all the Lord has blessed the effort and the work in prophetic interpretation that I've been studying for the last 13 years or more. And there are persons who are in here right now with me who have studied most of that time with me and know that this is not a knee jerk response. As I said to you before, it's been documented in shadows in this book. And I've waited over 10 years to preach this message. Because I wouldn't want to preach something that I don't believe. And I'm sold on this message because I've seen it over the years being fulfilled. You're hearing the truth. You need to believe. So the great crisis awaits the people of God. A crisis awaits the world. The question of enforcing Sunday observance has become one of national interest and importance. But here is my closing point. God desires his people to what? Prepare, Prepare for the soon coming crisis. Prepared or unprepared, they must all meet it. And those who only have brought their lives into conformity to the divine standard will stand firm at that time of test and trial. So friends, time is running out still. Preparing for the crisis. That's what we're going to discuss this evening at 4 o'clock. What it does it require to prepare for the crisis? What does it require to prepare for the crisis? Come back this evening at 4 o'clock, friends. And as usual, I invite you to go to the website, www.harvestmessageintl.org, and these are different full series. These are not lectures, series. Some as, as much as 24 lectures in there. Come back later, friends, and be a part of that as we discuss preparing for the crisis. We're going to close off in prayer now, shall we pray?